Hey everybody, I hope all is going well. Um, today I'm going to give you guys a video. It's going to be lecture video 1.2, which is the logic of sampling distributions. And as things go, especially in chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10, the logic that I'm going to go over this video really in this video really underlies everything, all of the logic that underlies everything we're going to do in those chapters. And sometimes it's going to feel like we're really thick in the weeds on the statistics stuff. But I want you to come back to any of these types of ideas when you feel like things are getting really complicated because everything underlies what I'm going to show you in this video. And it turns out that you probably intuitively already understand what I'm going to show you in this video. And it's just a lot of statistics is just language. It's like, how do I express what I kind of already know in a concise way, also providing rigorous evidence for things that we know, and I'll use that in the example in this video. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of just to do it like a board lecture with notes. And the first thing we're gonna do is talk about the distribution of a single dice. I had to look it up, but nowadays it's okay to call one die a dice in standard English basically, or apparently, and I didn't know that before I made this video. But so I'm gonna to try to call it a dice, but if I say die, I still mean one dice. So most of you probably know, but just in case, a dice is just a cube with six numbers on it, right? So one side, so we have a cube right here. Let's see if I can draw a cube. Something like that. It's got different numbers, so there's a one, a two, there's a three. So there's a cube and each side has a different number, one through six, because the cube has six sides, right? So it's a six-sided cube. You may have come across them in board games or something that you've played before. And each side has a number on it, so one of the sides has a one. So if we just draw one of the sides, it has a one. One side has a two, and they're usually just a dots, but they could be written as numbers too. And then the last side has six dots. So basically when you roll a die, you have an equal chance of getting numbers one through six. So that's the example we're gonna start working with. And it's a really simple example to use because you probably already kind of understand how a dice works. But one way statisticians like to express how a dice works is by drawing what's called a frequency distribution. So let's label our axis. Always label your axis. X equals number on dice. And on this graph, up here we're gonna write the probability of x. So what's the probability of getting numbers? So on this axis, we only have six numbers, so we can just write one, two, three, four, five, six. And now to express in statistical terms how a dice works, we can think, okay, well, the probability of getting a one is one sixth. So I can put that in a graph by going to one and above that just drawing a line. And that line says, okay, the probability of getting a one is on the y axis and it's one sixth right there. Similarly, the probability of getting a two is one sixth, right? Because there are six sides on a dice. One of those sides has a one on it. So if I roll the dice, there's a one in six chance or a one sixth probability that I get a one. There are six sides on a dice. One of them has a two on it. So there's also a one sixth chance that I get a two. Same with three, four, five, and six. So this is a really simple probability distribution in statistics. It's basically just a rectangle, right? This graph represents how a dice works in statistics. It tells us all the different possible numbers right here. 
These are possible outcomes, or sometimes statisticians call those events. And then on the y-axis, we're just showing, well, what's the probability of each different outcome? And it's always one-sixth for an individual dice, right? That's also called a uniform probability because probabilities are uniform. They're the same across different outcomes. So sometimes people refer to that as a uniform probability distribution. And you probably had to talk about uniform probability distributions in when you were doing um, the first statistics class, because I know you guys talked about some different distributions in that class. Well, now we're going to talk about distributions of n dice. So first of all, let's define a couple things. What do I mean by n? n is going to be the sample size. So if I roll two die, two dice, then the sample size is two. If I roll five, the sample size is five and so on. So we can think about how these different distributions are gonna work. We're also gonna do X bar, and that's gonna be the sample average. So say I roll, so let's have N equals five. Then if the number on the first die, if x1 equals a number on first dice, x2 x2 is going to equal number on you should say on second dice dot 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 x5 is equal to number on fifth dice then x bar how do we get x bar we take x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 and divide it by n which in that case is 5 so the sample average and we might write x bar 5 right here to say that's the sample average when we have 5 die. Now we could also say x bar n for the general case where we're not even saying what our sample size is. One way to write that would be x1 plus x2 plus dot dot dot. Keep adding until you get to n, whatever the last number is, and then divide by n. So those are just the formulas that you know. I mean, you've probably calculated your average grade before. So you take your grade on the first homework, you take your grade on the second homework, all the way up to the fifth homework if you have five homeworks in the class, and then you divide by five to get your average grade on the homework, right? So most of you, whether you knew it or not, are familiar with doing averages. But now let's think about what the sampling distribution of x bar is gonna look like. So x bar is different, right? x was just the number on a single die. x bar n is gonna be the average of a bunch of different rolls. So I'm not even gonna draw the, x, the y axis anymore, but just keep in mind that when I'm drawing these distributions, the thing that's always represented on the vertical axis or the y-axis is the probability of those different events occurring. So let's just start thinking about, well, what if we had five die? Up here we saw that to get a one, we had a one-sixth probability on just one die. Well, what would have to happen for me to get a one? So one, two, three, one, two, three, four, four, five, six. So what would have to happen? Let's move this over because I guess I used up too much space. So this axis is going to be x bar n. Well, notice that to get a one, an average of one, there's only one way to do that. 
every single number, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5 have to all be one. Because then I'd have one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one, which would be five. Five divided by five is one. That is the only way to get an average of one. If I get any number other than one, my average will be higher than one, right? Also, six is the same way. The only way to get an average of six would be to get six, 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 and six. And then that would be 30 divided by five would be six. So there's only, there's really only one way of many different ways you could roll five die. There's only one way you could get an average of one. And there's only one way you could get an average of six. So I actually, I lied. I'm going to draw, just to remind you guys, this is still going to be the probability of X right here. But now it's the probability of X bar, right? So once we start taking averages, we're going to have a relatively low probability of getting a one or a six, because there's only one way to do that. On the other hand, if you think about it, there's a lot of different ways you might get a three or a four. In fact, the most common number you're going to get if you roll lots of die are going to be right at 3.5 because that's the population mean, as we'll get into more later on in the semester in just a couple videos from now. The population mean of a die is actually 3.5, which is a little bit weird to think about because that number is not even actually on the dice. But once you start adding and dividing, as you guys know, we could get a decimal, right? So that is the exact center of the distribution. To see that, take the two endpoints, six and one. Six plus one divided by two is 3.5. You'd also get that number if you did one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six divided by six, you'd get 3.5. That is the center of the distribution. It's also the center of this distribution up here, right? Right in the middle, 3.5. But now we can actually get it once we start adding and dividing through samples. So there's going to be a lot of ways to get that number. So that's going to have the highest probability right here. Because we don't have to get the same number every time, right? We could get a lot of different combinations of numbers that would add in such a way that when we divide by 5, we get our 3.5. And so the way this probability distribution works is now we get what's called a bell curve, right? So once we go from looking at individual values on a dice, which had a uniform distribution with just a flat line, once we start rolling more die and looking at averages, we get a bell curve. Taking samples and looking at sample averages, it turns out no matter what the underlying thing is, whether it's a dice, whether it's costs at a company, oil prices, supply chain prices, number of customers that walk into Starbucks per hour, if we do averages, we always get bell curves, which is really a cool thing because that's what's going to help us start doing all of the powerful stuff we're going to do later in this semester with statistics. Is that once we start taking averages, we get pressure towards the true mean. Now, another really important thing, what's going to happen to this curve? So that was for five or just some arbitrary number, really. But what would happen if instead of doing five, let's pretend the red curve was for n equals five, what would happen if I did n equals 100? What's gonna happen to the probability of getting a one? So to, do, to get an average of one when I have five die, I have to get five ones in a row, right? Or five ones on all five die that I roll. Now to get an average of one when I have a 100 die, what would have to happen? Well, I'd have to get a hundred ones. That is going to have an even tinier probability, probably basically zero. 
Similarly, to get a six, I'd have to get a hundred sixes in a row. I mean, this is gonna be basically impossible, right? So those are gonna be tiny, even relative to having five ones in a row, getting a hundred ones in a row is gonna be crazy low probability. On the other hand, when I take a bigger sample, that lower probability of a one has to go somewhere, and where does it go? It goes towards the middle of the distribution. So I have a lower probability of getting extreme values like one or six, but at the same time, I have a higher probability of getting values in the middle. This idea is gonna drive all of the important stuff that we look at in statistics, basically throughout the semester. This idea of taking samples and calculating sample averages, is, and the fact that when we calculate sample averages and take bigger samples, we get closer and closer and closer to the true mean is what that 3.5 is, that's gonna drive everything. Now, in the case of dice, it's like, well, I already knew that the true mean was 3.5, so it's not that powerful. But what if I said, what's the true mean oil price in the United States? What's the true mean number of customers that walk into Walmart every Sunday? These are numbers that a stock analyst for Walmart or a manager at Walmart or a oil producer or a refinery owner or a gas station owner might be really interested in. But those numbers do not come from rolling a cube. Those numbers come from crazy complicated events. But what's really cool is that no matter what the underlying distribution looks like, so maybe X bar, or no, X is gonna be individual values of customers going to Walmart per day. That could be a crazy distribution. That could be, well, some Sundays there's a really bad storm and nobody goes. Usually, there's a big kind of middle here. This is kind of the mo the number you see the most of people going to Walmart on Saturdays is about 400 or something. No, that's probably not enough. How do you know how many people go to Walmart on a Sunday, you guys? 762 is the highest, the mode we'd call that. That's the highest observed value. But then some days, like on July 3rd, Everybody's like, I forgot hot dogs. I forgot my fireworks. I forgot my gun. Then you get these cre crazy outliers over here, right? So you get a weird distribution of, when you look at individual probabilities for the number of customers going to Walmart, you get a weird distribution. But guess what? Guess what happens when we take the average across 100 different Walmarts or the same Walmart on 100 different days, guess what kind of distribution we get? We get a nice bell curve, just like we got for the die. And in this case, that guy is gonna be centered at mu, the true population mean, which we're gonna go over in more detail in the next video. And it's gonna be a nice bell curve. Even though we started with this crazy skewed curve, this part out here, it's called skewed right when we have these big outliers. This also is probably what the distribution of incomes in the US economy looks like, right? Not very many people earn nothing, but a lot of people earn about 50K. And then a very few people earn a million dollars a year or $5 million a year, they're way out here. The probability of observing one of those is very low. But once we tar start taking samples of 100 people, guess what happens? We start to get bell curves, and that's really cool. Because once we have bell curves,
which are gonna, there's gonna be a couple of different types of bell curves, but no matter what type we have, once we have bell curves, we can calculate the probability of different events, okay? So why would we care about calculating probabilities? Well, maybe if I'm playing a game with you while we just roll a die and I'm like, boom, I got a six. And you're like, oh, I got a one and I win because I got the higher number. And then we play again and I get a six again. And I just keep getting sixes. So say I get five sixes in a row and you get five ones in a row. Or say I get five sixes in a row, you get a one, a three, a five, and a two. The probability of those exact things happening are exactly the same, actually. So six, 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 versus three, one, five, two, four. The probability of me getting this six is one sixth, one sixth, one sixth, one sixth, one sixth. And those, when I add those together, by the way, I get 30. And if I divide by six, or sorry, five, I get six. So my average is six. Now, the probability of you getting a three, then a one, then a five, then a two, then a four, just that row of probabilities in that exact order is the same as me getting six, because there's a one-sixth probability you get a three, there's a one-sixth probability you get a one, a one-sixth probability you get a five, one-sixth two, one-sixth four. But what happens if we add them together and we get four, nine, 10, 11, 15, 15 divided by five equals three, we can't use this curve up here to say that I'm cheating because remember, the probabilities of those individual events are all the same. But if we go down here, you can say, hey, now I have evidence that you're cheating because there is a high probability of me getting a three. But there's a very low probability of you getting a six once we take averages. So once we take, we can never make conclusions like that when we're looking at individual values, even if we're looking at individual values in a row. But we can start to draw conclusions once we look at averages because the probability of getting an average of six is very low the probability of getting an average of three is very high. So sampling allows us to make conclusions. And in this class, we wanna look at data to try to make conclusions using data. That is the point of statistics. It's the point of you taking this class. And just like I said before, that logic does not break down once we go into the more complicated world of customers at Walmart, 752, or incomes, 50K, or oil prices, 30 bucks. Those are all really interesting and important business world things. Once we start taking averages, we can start calculating the probability of different events occurring because we have bell curves. And that's what we're gonna get into really for the next few chapters of the semester. But remember, this is the logic behind everything that we're doing. And if you get lost in the math later on, as I mentioned, we're not gonna try to be doing, whoa, that's crazy. We're not gonna be trying to do any crazy math, but we will be dealing with complicated subjects. And anytime that you lose what's going on again, man, I'm just buried in what this particular example when we're moving to more complicated examples, go back to the dice. The logic lives in those dice even though we're going to be dealing with more complicated stuff. So I'll see you guys soon in the next